Can you hear me? All right, that's better. You know, when you're in your tent at 8,000 meters and it's a 30 knot wind outside, it's minus 30 degrees, you're breathing a third of the oxygen that is at sea level, you really don't want to get out. But that's my job, you see. I'm the guy that takes people up to the top of Everest. So I'm that guy that drags you out. Because in mountaineering, we have a saying, you don't summit in your sleeping bag. <laughs> so that's really what I'm here to talk to you about today, which is getting you out of your comfort zone to do things. Um, people, when they climb, they just see the mountain in front of them. And they forget their ability that they can get to the top. And I've always felt that Mahatma Gandhi said it right. Be the change you want to see in the world. And so that's how I lived my life. I've always been that guy that wants to bridge the gap to get people onto the other side. And, <laughs> sorry. Um, I'm sorry, I'm a little bit nervous today. <laughs> it's, it's a big, big group. Um, yeah, so the reason I think I'm good at bridging gaps is I was born to a Sherpa father and a Belgian mother, one born at 4,000 meters at the shadow of Mount Everest, the other one at sea level. And, and so when we were all together as a family, we'd speak in English because mom and dad did not speak each other's languages. But when I spoke to dad, I'd speak in Nepali, and when I spoke to mom, I'd speak in Dutch. And so it became natural for me and my, my two siblings, my two brothers, to see things in a different way. And it's in that same way that people come up to me and say, Dawa, how do you climb a mountain? Can I do it? Is it possible? And again, I say, yeah, of course it's possible, man. You just need to believe in yourself. And that's the great irony. People see the mountain in front of them, but they don't believe, they don't see the ability in themselves to do it. And so I'd like to share a small story about myself and, and the small mountains that I climbed. It all started for me on a mountain called Choyu in 2006, and it's the, it's the sixth highest mountain in the world, it's 8,201 meters, and when I was there, it was my first big mountain, people were so unfriendly and competitive and bitter towards each other there, and I just didn't understand it. Here we were, climbing one of the highest mountains in the world, and instead of reveling in the moment, we're all being, you know, unfriendly towards each other. And, I made a promise to myself, the next time I go on an expedition, I want to make things better. I want to change the place I'm at. I want to make a, a nice social place where people who can, can come together and share stories and, and, and be friendly. So t six months later, in the spring of 2007, I set up the Everest Base Camp Bakery. And so I was serving apple pie and coffee at Everest Base Camp. And it was that year when I was climbing Mount Everest that I saw for the first time the effects of climate change. You know, the ice was melting, seracs were collapsing, avalanches happening, rock falls happening. And I really thought to myself, geez, this is a big problem because so many climbers are out here on the mountains and it's just a matter of time before somebody falls victim to this. Deaths are going to happen. Fatalities, injuries, and they're happening more and more each year. So I really wanted to do something about this, but I'm just a, a mountaineer, and at that I'm a young mountaineer, I didn't really know where my place lay in, all, in this whole climate change debate. All I knew was the ice was melting. And so I really started thinking, and then the, the answer came to me in a very strange way. It's usually, you know, as young people do, we go to parties and so on, and you know, the, the girls, and my, my girlfriends who would be out there, they'd be talking to guys and so on, and every so often they would meet this, this guy who they don't want to talk to, so the best strategy they employed was, hey, Dawa, come here, come here, I want to introduce you to somebody. And they would say, have you met my friend? He's climbed Mount Everest. So the guy would instantly focus on me when my friend ran away. So the point is, People were interested in what I had to say. When I said Mount Everest, people were interested. And I thought maybe I could use this as a platform. Maybe Everest is the key. Maybe getting back up there again would be the key to getting people to listen to what's happening to the Himalayas. And so that video you earlier saw, that was me in 2008. And since then, every year we've been going back up Mount Everest. And we've been taking, we've been taking the message to the top. Stop climate change, let the Himalayas live. It's a very simple message, 
but I think it's very powerful. And this particular photograph, thanks to WWF and other networks, has gone to the corners of the world. I've had friends from Georgia and the USA email me and say, Dawa, I saw that picture, you know, and I, it's fantastic. On the other hand, what's, what it's also done is made every Nepali citizen aware about climate change and what it's doing to our country. I'll get onto that a little bit later. But it was from that experience, from the climbing, that I also realized that there was another more immediate problem we, we were facing on the mountains, and that's that of garbage and human waste, excrement. It wasn't being managed properly. And again, I thought, what can I do? I'd like to clean this up. But organizing an expedition costs hundreds of thousands of dollars, and that's the sort of money I don't really have. And so I thought about flipping things on its head, I thought about, how about if we talk to each person at base camp, each person on the mountain, and make them responsible? So, with regard to the excrement, what I did was I traveled to the United States, and through my contacts in the American Alpine Club, we imported toilet bags that they use in the, in the national parks there, and introduced it on Mount Everest. And just to make people a little bit more responsible and make sure that there's no confusion and there's no swapping of bags, I put everybody's name on it. You see, so when I handed them out, nobody would be carrying somebody else's doo-doo. <laughs> so that worked really well. And so each person then became responsible for carrying his own waste off the mountain. But when I started that program, that big fear of mine was, how are people going to respond to it because of cultural sensitivities? But as one of my lead Sherpas said in front of a big meeting, before I was carrying it here, now I'm carrying it here. What is the difference? So that's when people looked up and said, yeah, that's a, that's a good point. Yeah, it's, there's no difference. And so when people were given the opportunity to do something, to make a change, they, they really jumped on it. But then the garbage situation, there's tons of garbage there's, there might still be about 50 tons of garbage up there on Everest. Nobody knows, because every year we clean up, and every year more garbage comes out because the glacier melts. So how did we clean, clean up the mountain? Like I said, I don't have a lot of money to take a huge crew up there. So we looked at the way of focusing on the garbage. Focus on the people who are going up on the mountain. I, said, I looked at them and said, hey, when we go up, we carry tents and food and fuel and everything. We set up camp up there, and then we come back down to base camp to rest. When we come down, we don't have anything in our backpacks. We're empty. So we went around and talked to everybody and said, hey, guys, if you find garbage on the way, bring it down. I'm going to weigh it, and there and then I'm going to pay you. I'm going to pay you per kilo of garbage. And we've been doing this since 2008, 2008, 2009, 2010, and 2011. And so far, we've collected 13,000 kilograms of garbage. I'm very proud of this, and the thing is, we can continue doing this, because it doesn't take a lot of money, it just takes people who want to be an a, active part of it. But the better thing, more than the garbage itself, is the fact that now, when you go to the mountain, and you see somebody else dropping garbage there, when you see somebody else, you will find another climber, go and talk to that person, because after all, he did clean it. It doesn't matter if he got paid for it, he feels that he's empowered now to talk to that person and say, hey, you can't do that. We've cleaned this mountain. This is our mountain. You can't do that. But there's another much bigger problem. The ice is melting. And the ice is turning into big, big glaciers. Uh, glacial lakes, rather. And these glacial lakes are threatening to come down, thunder down valley, and flood the villages below. The communities that live in the valleys, they really can't go anywhere. And the problem is, if that flood comes down, we're going to be losing not only houses and farms and forests, but also unique cultures. So, I had that experience of being able to engage with my friends, fellow mountaineers, motivate them, and then get them involved. And so, using the same idea, I got in touch with the local youth clubs who are already on some level working on these issues, who, who already were aware about climate change and, and the melting of the glaciers. And so we organized the Kumbu Festival. And the Kumbu Festival 
was organized to showcase these unique cultures, the dances, the songs, the food, the, all of that. At the same time, we also went to the different schools and we organized a letter writing competition and an art competition. And this one, the art competition was amongst the primary school kids and it was, their, their task was draw what has changed since your grandfather's time. And I tell you, it's a very grim message. And talking about messages, we wanted to highlight the threat that Imja Lake, that particular lake I showed you earlier, was all about. So we organized a run from 5,000 meters where the lake was down to 3,800 meters. The fastest runner ran from Imja Lake to Fungitanga Bridge near the end in 2 hours and 30 minutes. It's predicted by the flood experts that that water, if it were to burst out, would reach Fungitanga in 35 minutes. So surely, it's not a problem we can run away from. Doing all of this, it caught the attention of uh, the WWF in Nepal, and they asked me if, if we would be willing to work together on a project, and it was called Climate for, Climate for Life. And the campaign, what we wanted to do was take the message, take it up another notch and go a little bit more global. Again, the whole Everest connection came in. Appa and myself, Appa Sherpa, who's climbed Mount Everest 21 times world record holder, the guy who's holding the banner earlier, him and I, we've been collecting rocks from the top of Mount Everest, a symbol that the, the peaks themselves are melting. It didn't used to be that you could pick up rocks at the top, now you can. And so we took these and we went to the Prime Minister of Nepal and we gave it to them and said, the next time, it was very soon, the next time you go to the UN, please hand these over to the world leaders. We also collected over 200,000 signatures of Nepalese youth and asked him to hand it over to Ban Ki-moon, the Secretary General of the United Nations. And so, he did. <laughs> Very nice picture. <laughs> So, Right Honorable Prime Minister Madhav Kumar Nepal, he met with Obama, he met oh, President Obama, I should say, and the then Prime Minister Gordon Brown and many other world leaders, and he did hand over those rocks. And I'm told that President Obama does talk about these rocks from time to time, which is, you know, I'm very proud of. Clicker. But then, more recently, what's been happening is people have been taking the lessons from Everest, from cleaning, being a part of it. I've had many people coming up to me, trekkers and trekking guides coming up to me and saying, hey, we're, we're not mountaineers. We don't, you know, we don't know what to do. How can we help? And the simple solution is just carry a plastic bag. Every time you come across, across litter, pick it up, put it in your plastic bag. Next time you see a dump, just chuck it in there. The national park will take care of it then. But just don't, if you see it, don't complain. And that's what's happening. People are getting involved. And when they're involved, they don't rely on somebody else to do it. They don't complain. They become part of the solution. We've also been doing thousands of uh, plantations of thousands of trees. And one particular thing that you'll see more and more of now in the Nepal Himalayas, uh, in the villages, are these nifty little devices called parabolic solar cookers. In 2008, I introduced them to Mount Everest Base Camp as a way to say, hey, if I can use it at 5,300 meters, surely you can use it in your houses, in your lawns, you know, just for your kitchen. It's not that difficult. And not what you will see now is as you walk on the way to Everest Base Camp, these are everywhere. And that's fantastic because they use the power of the sun to boil water, where otherwise you, they would be cutting down trees and in more extreme cases, juniper. And in some cases, the juniper, which is six inches thick, can take over a hundred years to grow. So, saving the environment at the same time. And we've been also working with Nepali students. They were engineering students at the time. Now they're, um, now they're working for the Alternative Energy Promotion Center uh, for the Ministry of Environment. At the time, these students were looking for somebody to support them. And these students, what they had done was built a completely indigenous wind turbine built in Nepal, but nobody was willing to believe in them. So we got together, we got the funding together, and we built this wind turbine. It produces 1.5 kilowatts, and everything is sourced locally within Nepal, 
And it's a great solution for Nepal. It's been two, two years now that it's been running and it's still producing great electricity. Clicker. Okay. Now looking into the future, these toilet bags that I talked about, I'm very proud to say that we've almost got it through the cabinet and they're going to be compulsory, mandatory, on every mountaineering expedition very soon. Hopefully by the end of this year, this is going to be declared and every expedition is going to have to use these toilet bags. We're also looking at building a climate change resource center in the Kumbu, Kumbu being my ancestral home. And there what we are planning to do is not just build another another wind, uh, a weather station. What we want to do is we want to engage local people, villagers. Everybody has a mobile phone. We, talk, we heard about that today. Everybody has a mobile phone these days. And so when the first bloom of the, of the season starts, the villagers can take a picture, bring it to the resource center, put it up. It can be put up on a database that could be useful to scientists. Similarly, there can also be uh, school, uh, school kids from the Eco Club who can come and man the weather station and be a part of, of all the science that's going on around them. They can be the ones that are involved and they can be the ones who change. And finally for myself, on the 15th of January, I'm going to be walking from the eastern border of Nepal to the western border of Nepal in 107 days, highlighting all the different, uh, all the 20 districts of Nepal uh, that are most vulnerable to climate change. And the reason for this is not just to be grim and tell people how bad it is, but I come from a tourism background. And from a tourism background, I also know that tourism can be a, a force for good. It can be a force for people to develop, economies, local economies to develop. And I think that tourism in the, in the context of Nepal is a very powerful tool for adaptation to climate change. So the, looking back now over the, the few years that I have now been, been involved in all these projects, I realized that it's been small mountains I've been climbing every time. Every time I climb a little peak and then I go home and I say, wow, that's fantastic. But I forget all the blood and the tears and the agony and the pain to get up there. And then I'm ready for the next one. And it's always like that. Mountaineers always want to go back up onto the next peak. And it's the same with people who want to change their world, whether it's their community, whether it's their circle of friends, or whether it's their country. Be involved in one small project, see it through to the end, and then you'll be thirsting to do the next one. So get out of your tent, get out of your sleeping bag, and start climbing. <laughs>